Intel has pulled some really underhanded, dirty, and just plain mean tricks over the last few decades to get ahead and stay ahead of AMD. Which is why we dedicated an entire video to said evil doings. You can check it out right up there. But as disruptive and dastardly as those practices were to AMD, we do well to remember that Intel wasn't the only thing holding AMD back. No, one of the biggest things keeping AMD from really flourishing over the years was AMD itself. AMD's own mismanagement, often apathetic leadership, business blunders, and other failings are just as much to blame for the company's lowest points as anything Intel threw its way, and that's what we'll be discussing in this video, but we're not Intel shills because we already covered Intel's crap earlier. So let's start with how AMD was down, but not out. And just like our video about Intel's least proud moments, this one really starts back in the early 80s. As we discussed in said video, Intel and AMD entered a technology exchange agreement because Intel needed a second supplier to secure a deal with IBM. The agreement worked out well for both sides. Intel got the deal with IBM, and AMD got access to some of Intel's chip designs and specifications. But when AMD started producing chips that were faster than Intel's at the same price, Intel dropped them like a hot AMD processor and refused to give them access to DT on newer chips. While AMD won arbitration after many years of arguing, they were still left without any further details of Intel's processors. This meant that they had to start getting creative, and creative they got. While it took about five years, AMD was able to reverse engineer the processors they were refused information on and produce the AM386. And said processor turned out to be, just like before, faster than what Intel could manage. This played out with future processors, including AM386DX, the AM486, and the remainder of the 486 lineup, where AMD would take what Intel did replicate it with better performance and sell it at a lower price. This proved to be good business for AMD and their earnings jumped more than double from $1 billion in 1990 to more than $2 billion in 1994. Eventually though, AMD got bored with reverse engineering Intel's processors and unveiled their first in-house processor, the K5, in 1996. Unfortunately for AMD, the K5 came late to the party and had more than its fair share of issues, including not really being a match for Intel's Pentium freight train. Knowing that they couldn't stop the Pentium train alone, AMD bought a company called NextGen, which was already producing chips that delivered Pentium-like performance. NextGen's NX686 processor effectively replaced and became AMD's K6. The K6 line went on to be highly successful and usually presented a better value value offering to what Intel had on hand. The success of the K6 line rolled right into the arrival of the K7, known better as Athlon. And we probably don't need to remind anyone about how good Athlon was at that point. The point here is that AMD was producing some dang good parts and was doing really well because of that. Then Intel released its Conroe architecture, out of which came the Core 2 Duo, Xeon, Pentium Dual Core, and Celeron chips, after which AMD kind of lost the plot entirely, which brings us to the actual meat of this video, or at least part of it. It's time for AMD to spend, spend, spend. And while AMD did well to recover from the whole Intel agreement fiasco and was really starting to turn things around, cracks started to appear. One of these cracks was reported by Ars Technica in an interview with Atik Raza, and the crack may well have been AMD's charismatic president and CEO. Jerry Sanders. Raza was the head of NextGen and served as AMD's president, COO, and CTO before allegedly leaving AMD due to a major fallout with Sanders. Raza explained that Sanders was a big spender in his personal life, which carried over into AMD spending habits. One major example of this, and one that led to Raza's final conflict with Sanders, was all about AMD building expensive fabrication plants it couldn't really afford and didn't really need. In the early 2000s, AMD was producing more chips than it could sell while at the same time building yet another very costly fabrication plant called the Dresden Fab 30. The company had planned to have the fab constructed and facilitated by the end of 2003 and estimated the whole thing to cost around $2.3 billion. That estimation and expected time of completion didn't stick, and eventually changed to $2.6 billion and completed in 2005. In 2002, AMD also invested another $440 million into another plant called Fab 36. These fabrication plants are largely to blame for AMD sporting net losses of $61 million in 2001, $1.3 billion in 2002, and $274 million in 2003. Raza is quoted as saying that Sanders laid the foundation for a fundamentally 
inefficient capital structure that AMD never recovered from. Another prime example of AMD's reckless spending habits is the company's purchase of graphics powerhouse, ATI. AMD wanted to expand its product lineup and wanted to integrate graphics processors into their CPUs, but lacked the tech to do so. ATI had the tech and the know-how, so the whole thing made a ton of sense. What didn't make sense, however, was how much AMD shelled out to acquire ATI. The deal cost AMD around $5.4 billion dollars along with a butt ton in stocks which represented 50 percent of amd's market capitalization at the time that price sounds insane because it was. According to analysts, AMD quote vastly overpaid in acquiring ATI, which is something AMD itself later admitted to when it absorbed $2.65 billion in write downs. And while spending money like it was going out of style is kind of okay for a multi-billion dollar company, a lot of it could have likely been better spent on R&D or improving and innovating products AMD already had in the works, but more on that in a little bit. Fun fact though, according to former AMD employees, before the company dropped all of that cash to snap up ATI, it approached NVIDIA for a possible acquisition first. Unfortunately for AMD, NVIDIA sandwich distributor in chief Jensen Wong would only be up for it if he became the big boss of the merged company. Obviously, because AMD's then CEO Hector Ruiz didn't want to make a deal that would cost him his job or potentially put him on the line for anything Jensen would do, they went with ATI instead. It's hard not to imagine what the PC market would have looked like if the deal had been made and Jensen had taken the reins, but that didn't happen and it was possibly a major misstep on AMD's part. These issues, as you'll see throughout the video, are at the root of most of AMD's most major failures over the years. AMD's management structure decision making as well as their lack of focus on the future sits at the heart of all of this in some way or another. Delays, lack of stability when it comes to supplying their customers with products, decisions that lead to bad products or products that didn't live up to their potential, all things that we're sure if we digged hard enough could be linked back to bad management. TechSpot echoed a similar observation in an article they released on the topic. They said, quote, the last seemingly ever present factor in AMD's decline pertains to management or lack thereof, a conscious effort to abstain from advertising and a near total absence from the software side of the business makes for a curious example of how to deliberately handicap yourself in the semiconductor trade. This allied with an enduring lack of strategic planning and apathetic at best leadership seemed to be the abiding portrait of a company run as a conglomeration of fiefdoms. We would need an entire separate video to really dig into the mismanagement of the company, so let's focus on the hardware of the matter here. So we have missed steps, missed opportunities, and some bad chips. Even though it was one of AMD's best years, things really started to fall apart for the company starting in 2006. As you'll remember, this was around the time Intel was paying everyone and their dogs to avoid AMD products like the plague. But while that shady tactics impact on AMD's business was undoubtedly hugely significant, AMD was equally responsible for its own downfall. Along with being a big old bribing poopy head, Intel also unleashed its phenomenal Core Series processors in 2006. About two weeks after that, in a possible attempt to steal some of Intel's new processors shine, AMD announced that its own K10-based quad-core Barcelona Opteron processor was finally ready to be unleashed after heavy delays. Unfortunately, for AMD, a bug was discovered that would, in rare cases, lock systems up entirely that were equipped with said chips and some Phenop processors. Even though that this was a rare bug, it was prevalent enough for AMD to halt K10 processor production and to issue a patch to fix the issue. Even more unfortunately, in order to fix the issue, the patch resulted in a performance loss of about 10%. Sounds a lot like some of the patches that aim to fix Intel's more recent Spectre and Meltdown flaws. Hmm, very similar circumstances indeed. Fixed versions of the processors did eventually start shipping quite some time after initial launch, long after it did a number on AMD's reputation. But even if these issues weren't a thing, AMD's chips were still handedly losing to Intel's new core lineup everywhere that it mattered. This all happened not long after it was confirmed that AMD wasn't able to supply enough processors to all of its customers. Around the same time, AMD also had the unenviable job of convincing people who bought into the Socket 939 boards, 
of which there were many, to jump ship to its new AIM-2 boards. This was an especially hard sell because the processors that AMD introduced to fit into the AIM-2 and AIM-2 Plus sockets were only marginally better than the ones that were designed for the 939, at least initially, and that seems oddly reminiscent of the current Coffee Lake lineup with LGA 1151. Same pin count, but you can't use the processors on each other unless you shunt the board. AMD's Phenom processors didn't bring enough to the table for most people to justify upgrading to it from their Athlon chips, all the while Intel's core lineup was killing it. Speaking of killing, AMD would have made a killing in the then soon to be burgeoning smartphone market had it not sold its handheld GPU tech to Qualcomm in 2009. AMD picked up said tech and the Imagion handheld graphics brand along with its acquisition of ATI only a few years earlier. AMD was undergoing a focus shift during that time and felt that offloading this likely not profitable enough mobile GPU division to Qualcomm would allow the company to better, quote, focus on its core business and leverage its unique position as a leader in both x86 computing and high-end graphics, end quote, which, you know, you know, probably sounded pretty good to AMD at the time. Qualcomm went on to rename the tech Adreno, which is a cheeky anagram of Radeon, in case you didn't know, and stuffed it into smartphones and became massively successful. The real kicker here is that AMD sold the tech for a mere $65 million back in the day which is insane, all things considering. Another ATI casualty of AMD's renewed narrow focus was Zillion, its digital TV division, which it sold to Broadcom in 2008 for $192.8 million. Maybe, just maybe, if AMD wasn't so adamant in spending as much money as possible when it originally acquired ATI, it wouldn't have had to sell off bits and pieces of it throughout the years. Intensifies. But AMD primarily acquired ATI in order to build beefy, innovative processors with integrated graphics. So what happened there? Well, right after announcing their acquisition of ATI, AMD also officially unveiled a project it called the Fusion Initiative. The initiative was basically a fancy way of saying AMD wanted to get into the APU game because as it stated, CPU and GPU compute capabilities will be essential in meeting the requirements of computing in 2008 and beyond. The only problem with this whole thing is that AMD didn't launch Fusion APUs in 2008 or 2009 or 2010. AMD delayed the launch of its Brazos and Lano APUs all the way into 2011, giving Intel even more time to build up the momentum with its core lineup. And when the APUs did finally make their way out of the darkness, they were a little underwhelming. Don't get us wrong, they were dang decent chips for the price and delivered the best possible iGPU experiences that could be had at the time on desktop and mobile, but they were a little meh due to their okay CPU performance. But hey, these APUs were built to be, you know, APUs. They weren't built to be CPU monsters. Another architecture AMD released in 2011 was expected to fill that role, but unfortunately, it failed miserably at doing just that. That's right, folks, it's the infamously disappointing Bulldozer FX family. Along with also arriving much later than expected, the Bulldozer chips didn't deliver nearly as much performance as was promised, or expected. The bulldozer parts, while sporting generous helpings of cores, just barely outperformed the chips they were replacing and couldn't match Intel's offerings due to abysmal IPC and weak single-threaded performance. That last part is especially important since most programs, games, or even operating systems at the time benefited far more from high single-threaded performance rather than higher core counts. Bulldozer was a disaster of an architecture and probably one of AMD's worst products to date in both performance performance and value. As for why it was so bad, an ex-AMD engineer had some insight to share. He explained that, quote, management decided there should be cross-engineering between AMD and ATI, which meant we had to stop handcrafting CPU designs, end quote. The switch to more automated and faster production led to a major hit to performance and efficiency because the job of engineers was offloaded to machines. Whatever the reasons behind the FX chips bombing, they bombed hard during a time AMD really couldn't afford for them to suck. The rest of AMD's lineup before the introduction of the outstanding Zen-based chips that single-handedly brought AMD back into relevancy in the desktop CPU market, it played out somewhat similarly to Bulldozer. Piledriver, Steamroller, and Excavator had some decent chips here and there that could sort of compete against Intel's offerings, but were ultimately forgettable hot messes that brought little to the table that hasn't already been on there for a good long while. It's like bringing a overcooked piece of stew to a 
dinner that already has nice good chicken noodle soup. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. But then let's talk about Vegas Sake. Luckily for AMD though, its Radeon division kept up with competition from the green team significantly longer. AMD and Nvidia cards battled it out throughout the years and barring a few exceptions, mostly went blow for blow. Still, that doesn't mean that AMD cards didn't suffer from some serious issues. Probably none more serious than some really janky driver support. From our own experience and from what we gathered in our research for this video, AMD drivers sucked. The list of driver issues users faced over the years would take up the entire length of this video. It would often take AMD months to release new drivers, and when they finally did land, a lot of them caused more issues than they solved. Luckily, with Raja Kadori back at the helm, Radeon committed to improve the quality of its drivers, which eventually resulted in the release of the Crimson drivers. And while these drivers still had their own problems, Problems, they weren't nearly as bad as those that came before. In fact, they were actually pretty good, and they just got better and better over the following years, resulting in the current adrenaline lineup. Unfortunately, improved drivers couldn't fix two of AMD's other issues, heat and power draw. It's become somewhat of a meme that AMD parts were hot, inefficient beasts, and it's a meme because it was true for the most part. AMD's cards, while usually offering on par or higher performance than their direct NVIDIA competitors, did so at much higher temperatures and drawing more power. Another area where Radeon often fell short was in the high-end market, and this was made most shockingly apparent in the current Pascal, Polaris, and Vega era. We're more than two years into the lifespan of NVIDIA's Pascal architecture, and AMD still has no answer to the GTX 1080 Ti. The RX 400 and 500 series held their own against NVIDIA's low to mid-tier lineup very well, and RX Vega was supposed to do the same at the high end. But as we all know by now, that didn't happen. The Vega cards were undoubtedly the most disappointing releases in recent memory, only barely beating out the GTX 1070 and 1070 Ti, and in certain very special cases, the 1080. They also did so, as AMD cards often do, running hotter than a toaster and at a price point that makes zero sense for the performance they were offering. You can spin it however you want, but the fact remains, the RX Vega cards are bad for the gaming in the current generation. You know the thing that they were built for, and AMD should feel bad, and they were delivered much later than Nvidia's cards, even though they barely can compete. But according to sources over at Forbes, AMD probably doesn't feel all that bad at all. Said sources claim that AMD's highly anticipated 7 nanometer Navi architecture isn't being developed for desktop graphics first, rather Navi is being developed for Sony's PS5. Under Raja Kadori's leadership, Radeon and Sony reportedly worked very closely in collaboration to develop Navi for the upcoming console, so closely that apparently two thirds of Kadori's engineering team was, quote, devoted exclusively to Navi against Raja Kadori's wishes, which resulted in a final RX Vega product Kadori was displeased with as resources and engineering hours were much lower than anticipated, end quote. That's right, kids. Vega might just suck as hard as it does because AMD, or perhaps more specifically Lisa Su, cared more about keeping Sony happy than keeping all of us happy. If true, this is just another prime example of AMD's management structure making some very strange calls that lead to yet another product performing far lower than its potential, being delayed well beyond what it should, and it's highly likely that had Kaduri's engineers given Vega the full attention it needed to be something really impressive, it totally would have been. But instead, what we got was poop. Hot, underwhelming poop. Now look, AMD had a tough time over the years, and we're not delusional enough to think that Intel's or even Nvidia's shenanigans, which we'll take a look at in a video soon enough, didn't play a massive role in it all. I mean, the first two videos in this History Of series was all about examining the incredible lengths that Intel went to in order to keep AMD down. But to blame AMD's numerous failures and disappointing product releases over the years solely on Intel or Nvidia isn't the right way to go about things, and is the victim mentality that I see a lot of AMD defenders propagating. It's not everybody else's fault, and even without shady interference from Intel to deal with, the internal structure and its questionable decisions, in our opinion, play just as large of a role in many of AMD's troubles. That being said, under the relatively new leadership of Lisa Su, AMD seems to be in a pretty good place right now with the Ryzen lineup proving to be as good or even better than anybody expected, including Intel. But even so, 
Ryzen wasn't without its issues. It launched late, just like most of AMD's big releases. It had more than its fair share of bugs, of which there weren't many, RAM support being a major one, and AMD still lagging behind Intel when it comes to IPC and single-threaded performance. All of that being said, we still absolutely adore the Ryzen platform. We love that it's giving us average consumers access to more cores and threads we've ever had before at affordable prices. We love that it offers more value to most of what Intel is offering. We love that even even though its single threaded performance isn't the best around, it's still more than enough for gaming and pretty much anything else. But most of all, we love that it reinvigorated competition in the CPU market, forcing Intel's hand in giving consumers better value, more powerful products at lower prices, and making them fail all over the place. Obviously, we don't want Intel to fail, but it clearly shows that they were in desperate need of some competition. And as it stands currently, AMD is doing a whole lot of things right, but it's not doing everything right, and certainly hasn't done everything right throughout its history. And forgetting that, or blaming it on everyone else other than AMD, just doesn't seem like the right way to go about it. And it should be noted that in this history of video, we didn't go over AMD's shaded and underhanding dealings because they don't really do that. They just make stupid decisions, not inherently evil ones like some would say that Intel and Nvidia do. They choose to do things that are shady that hurt their own company, not something that stifles the competition of other people, which I guess is par for the course. So no matter what, AMD at least has that going for it. They're not as crappy as other companies might be, but that is gonna wrap it up for this history of video. Be sure to let us know what you thought. If there were any mistakes, please let us know down in the comments. Civilly, of course, we tried our best. We did as much research as we possibly could. So as far as we could tell, everything was accurate, but let us know if you have any discussion otherwise. Also, please let us know what you will want us to do another history of video on. We have plenty of companies lined up, Apple, Nvidia, everybody is gonna be included in this series. You guys seem to like it. So be sure to hit that like button. If you did enjoy this video, please get subscribed to stay up to date on all of our tech related content, including the History of series, our hot news series, as well as any other benchmarking that we might do. And that's gonna wrap it up for me. I'm Brett with the UFD Tech Channel. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see your smiling faces again in the next video. Cheers.